Welcome to the final lecture of our course on operating systems. So today we will not cover any new topics, but uh, instead we will just review our semester and I will give some hints on what is relevant and uh, especially also what might be interesting, especially uh, considering the exam, what is not relevant for the exam. And we'll go through all the relevant topics by just asking a number of questions you uh, yeah, should consider and you should try to answer yourself without referring to lecture materials. And if you can't answer one of the questions well, you should probably uh, go and reread the slides, uh, rewatch some of the videos, and maybe also take a look at some of the additional materials and our textbooks. So this is obviously the uh, all-time number one question. What's relevant for the exam? Of course, that's urgent. You want to pass the exam. You only have so much time available to learn for all your exams. So that's a very relevant question. I can obviously understand why this is relevant. And so I wanted to give you some hints on which things you can safely ignore for the exam. So obviously, first, everything is relevant, but we make some exceptions. So we will not consider the contents of lecture 13 on real-time scheduling for the exam, so there won't be any questions on real-time scheduling and real-time scheduling approaches such as EDF. Uh, but note that general scheduling in lecture 12, this is a very important topic for the exam and of course for operating systems in general, so please don't ignore lecture 12. I've also decided not to ask questions about the contents of lectures 19 and 20. So we, we will not ask questions about the embedded systems parts, part one and two of this course. Also lecture 22 was an experiment to yeah, have you, uh, to get you some insight uh, how uh, similar stuff is taught at different universities. So this security topic number two in lecture 22, which was this external video, is also not relevant. And finally, we've also decided to exclude the guest lecture by Anne Elster, lecture 23. So essentially, this leaves you with all of the lectures not mentioned in the exceptions here. Especially also important are topics we uh, discussed in the practical exercises. So you should have some experience working on the practical exercises uh, in order to help you with the exam. And of course, even if they were not mandatory, the theoretical exercises were very useful and are very useful to actually give you some background, to show you some typical questions already that can well occur in the exam. And of course, you'll also have the example exam questions I posted recently. So. You can ignore lectures 13, 19, 20, 22, 23, and all the others might show up in one form or the other as a question in the exam. So what about the C crash course we had in the very beginning? Now, of course, the exam will definitely require quite some intensive knowledge of C, so on a bit of an advanced level, so on the level you would be required to know to solve the practical exercises, but we won't ask any specific questions about details of C programming in general. So of course you have to know how to apply C programming, how to read C programs, how to maybe find and fix errors in C programs. Uh, so this is obviously essential, but we're not going into details of C syntax and so on. So I won't ask you, uh, like, for example, a question like, this is a C program, which errors in this C program would your compiler complain about? That's not part of the operating systems course. But of course, uh, a similar question could be, this is a C program, this is supposed to print this and that using Unix system calls. And why is it printing something else? Uh, so that might be a valid question, actually. What about specific Unix knowledge? Well, obviously, you need to have some knowledge about Unix because we have demonstrated the operating con uh, systems concepts in this course using examples from Unix system calls, from Unix libc functionality. 
but we won't require a knowledge uh, of specific Unix or Linux implementations. So you don't need to know how things are done precisely on macOS. I won't ask a question how are things working on macOS or how are things working in detail on Linux. But of course, you should know like how something that's common to many or most Unix systems like fork and exec work, how the shell works and so on. So you should have knowledge about the general use of Unix system calls and libc functions as we discussed it in the course, but we won't ask like what's the difference in behavior of functionality X between Linux and Mac OS X. That would be pretty unfair and so obviously we won't expect this. There's one exception to that rule actually and this is file systems. So we have discussed different file system implementations like system 5 and BSD file systems. So these are obviously specific to different Unix versions. These are different implementations of file systems and you should know a bit about the differences here. So as I already mentioned, the rest of this lecture is a quick walkthrough uh, that should serve as a summary of the most relevant topics we discussed in this semester in our course. And this should be seen as something like a minimum amount of knowledge. So not only about the areas, but about the most important topics in the areas, which I expect you to know about for the exam. But obviously this is not exhaustive, so there are more details. So just being able to answer the questions we pose here, well, gives you a good idea that you have an overview of the topics, but of course you also need, uh, well, quite a bit of knowledge about certain details. Well, since this is going to be an open book exam, you will obviously be able to look up a number of details in the lecture slides, and this is also what is expected. So, as you've probably seen in the example exam, the questions are, well, posed uh, relatedly. So we're not just asking you to reproduce knowledge because that's just copy and paste or just typing stuff from the slides or the book. That doesn't make sense. So most of the questions actually ask you to explain something in your own words, to apply some knowledge, to analyze something. So essentially what you did, for example, also as part of the practical exercises. As I mentioned already, the takeaways from each of the lectures that are relevant for the exam are now given as a number of questions. So I won't answer these questions here, but of course you should try to answer them for yourself. And if you can answer them, well, quite well, but of course you should verify your answers. If not, well, obviously you need to read up on some stuff. Well, as mentioned at the beginning, some lectures are not relevant for the exam, and so I won't summarize them in the following slides. So after the C crash course, we started off with a general introduction to operating systems. We talked a lot about the history of computing and the history of computers worldwide and in Norway, and also the related history of operating systems. So there were many details in there. And obviously you don't need to learn facts like what was the first Norwegian computer, who was the person building it, or when was it designed, stuff like that. That's interesting, but it's not relevant for the exam. What is important from that lecture is a number of takeaways. So some very general questions like why were operating systems developed in the first place? So why did we actually need operating systems for computers? Because obviously the first computers didn't have operating systems. Then how did the features of operating systems evolve over time? So over the last like six or so decades. And what did this have to do with the increasing capabilities that computer hardware actually had? So did hardware developments necessitate the development of new operating system functionality? Or were there other requirements from users that required other operating system functionality, which in turn required hardware developments. And of course, quite important, what is an operating system after all? So how do we defer, define the term operating system today? But as I said, you don't need to learn any historical facts of old computers or operating systems by heart. 
that's not relevant for our exam. So lecture two then gave a general overview of tasks of an operating system, especially considering resources and their relation to computer architecture. So essentially how the operating system interacts with the hardware of your computer, how this hardware of your system is represented as resources and an overview of how all of this is managed. So we gave a quick review of what the building blocks of a computer system are. You should of course already know this from previous lectures. Uh, then we uh, gave an overview of which resources are actually represented by these building blocks and how they might be managed like CPUs, like memory, uh, like external devices and so on. We gave an overview of how code of the operating system interacts with hardware resources, for example, uh, different modes to interact with devices like interrupts or DNA. And uh, also you should ask yourself what are actually the most relevant developments in computer architecture of these last couple of decades and which problems and benefits are actually related to these developments. So here you might think about like you have multi cores nowadays or multi processors. So what's the benefit of this? What are the problems related to this? And what does the operating system actually have to do with multi cores? And what are the challenges, for example, of a multi core system for the operating system? Lecture three then continues that topic and goes into details of the challenges and tasks of operating systems. So here we are talking about the abstractions provided by the operating system to make the life of programmers, of application programmers easier. So for example, the idea that all devices of a certain class are represented identically. And so uh, we discussed which abstractions a modern operating system actually provides, like abstractions for CPUs, for processes, memory, file systems, security, and so on and so forth, and what they look like. And we had a look at the first very important abstraction a process. So can you define what a process actually is? Can you explain how processes interact with each other and with the operating system? Especially we talked about fundamentals of parallel executing processes related to synchronization and deadlocks. Uh, we uh, had a look at different views of processes. So for example, a a uh, time view, a uh, processor, instruction execution view, and so on. Why do these different views of processes exist? And how, what do they have in common? And we also had a look at the states, a process, so this abstraction of several things has or can have, what uh, the uh, characterizes these different states and also which transitions, for example, exist between these states in a very simple model for process states. So after that, we uh, went into much more detail in lecture four, which concentrated exclusively on processes and their Unix implementation. So here again, you should know what the definition of a process is and you should know what the difference between a process and a program is. You should know about Unix processes, for example, about the Unix process hierarchy, what it looks like, why it was actually invented. So you should know about terms like parent and child process, like orphans, zombies. You should be able to explain them. You should know why there is a special process with the process ID1, the init process, and what its functionality is. Then you should know how processes can actually interact with I.O. resources. So how can processes perform I.O. in Unix? How can this be configured or reconfigured? So you should know about standard communication channels, standard I.O. like standard input, output and standard error. You should know about a bit about the Unix philosophy and how this is related to the I.O. concept. So everything is a file. Uh, what does this file look like? How is it characterized? And how can I actually exploit this simple structure to build more complex applications. Then we had a look at how processes interact with the operating system. So we had a look at system call functionality and related the other way around. How can actually you as a user or the operating system control processes? So control the creation, 
uh, control the runtime behavior of processes, for example, to suspend a process and to continue a process, and also to forcibly terminate a process. So we had to look at Unix system calls, important for process management, like fork and exec. And we also discussed pros and cons of the Unix fork exec model and why this is relevant. We also discussed optimizations for process creation in Unix, so you should probably know what copy or write means and how it works and why this is actually an optimization. And we also discussed an extended process state model and you should know some details about this. So what are extended states? Why are they actually required in a real world system? Why is this very simple model we discussed in the uh, lecture before not actually relevant uh, when we implement a real world system? In the following lecture, we discussed threads as an alternative to processes. So we found out that processes are relatively heavyweight because of all the processing that has to be done to create new processes and to switch between processes. So threads were implemented as a lightweight abstraction and an alternative to processes. So uh, for the discussion of threads, you should know why there is an overhead for traditional Unix processes their creation, switching between processes, and so on. And well, how, how you could, for example, describe this overhead in which terms like time or memory or whatever. Uh, then uh, you should know about address spaces as one of the abstractions in an operating system as an abstraction for memory. So you should be able to explain the differences between the address spaces present in different processes versus different threads. You should also know about thread models in Unix and Windows, not in extreme detail, but you should be able to explain some of the differences. And finally, in that lecture, we also talked about thread alternatives like fibers. So you can have threads in the operating system kernel, traditional threads, and you can also have the user level threads, which are called fibers. So uh, these have different pros and cons. So you should be able to explain the differences and to discuss the pros and cons, so the benefits and drawbacks of threads and fibers. And finally, we had a look at cooperative multi-threading. So we had a look at some mean tricks. You don't need to understand all the details, for example, behind Duff's device, but you should be able to describe the ideas behind things like Duff's device and also proto threads. You don't need to be able to reproduce the implementation of proto threads from uh, yeah, the back of your head. And we certainly won't give you a proto thread implementation to find the errors there, though that would be interesting. I think that could be very frustrating. So you don't have to know implementation details, but you should know what uh, these approaches are, how they can be used, and uh, yeah, what, what their benefits and problems might be. So when we have several parallel activities like processes or threads, you uh, usually want to have uh, well several processes or threads cooperating to solve a problem. So in lecture six, we talked about concurrency and especially how to handle things we are going to communicate and how to enable or ensure that this access to a shared resource is actually undisturbed by any other process that might be running in parallel. So we are talking about mutual exclusion and synchronization. So how do parallel activities interact? What problems can occur and how can we solve these? So uh, we talked about shared data or shared memory communication. We talked about why this can be problematic. Uh, so you should be able to give an example of such a problematic situation, maybe even give a bit of example code for a problematic situation and explain why the problem occurs. You should ask yourself uh, if you can understand multi-thread code using shared data. Uh, what's really important is, of course, a race condition. So uh, can you explain what a race condition is? Can you maybe give one or two examples for these? And uh, especially important, of course, is the question, why are these race conditions actually hard to detect and hard to debug? Then, of course, we were talking about solutions to all these synchronization problems. So uh, we uh, talked in general about what synchronization is, what it is used for, what, what different options for synchronization are out there. One especially important term is the term critical section. So can you 
define the term critical section. And then we talked about several technical implementations, for example, about locks. So can you explain what a lock is, how a lock is used? And for locks, uh, we would also expect you, because that's one of the central topics of operating systems, to be able to give details on some implementations, like what is an atomic operation? How can this be used for implementing a lock? Uh, why can you uh, implement locks by suppressing interrupts? What are the limits and problems of that? What are, uh, what are semaphores? Uh, how can they be used? How can they be implemented? Which operations exist on semaphores? So can you in general define the use uh, from a programmer point of view for application programs and also implementation of semaphores? And also can you describe maybe one or two problems like a reader writer problem that can be solved using semaphores. And finally, we talked about a semaphore alternative, the monitors. So you should also be able to explain what a monitor is, and you should be able to explain the difference between semaphore solutions and solutions using monitors in an operating system. In lecture seven, then, we took a detailed look at concurrency problems, so deadlocks and starvation. So problems that can show up even if you use or especially because you use synchronization and possible solutions for this. So uh, in this lecture, you should be, after this lecture, you should be able to define the terms deadlock and live lock. You should be able to explain situations that can lead to both a deadlock and a live lock. Then we talked about the necessary conditions for deadlocks to occur, but we also need a additional required condition so a deadlock actually shows up in the system so you should know about these conditions you should know what they are and you should be able to explain them then you should uh, well probably be able to explain which types of resources exist that uh, what are related to synchronization so what stuff can you actually synchronize about and uh, then uh, you should know how to model synchronization in an operating system using resource allocation graphs. So what are the components of a resource allocation graph? How do you construct it? And how can you use this resource allocation graph to detect a deadlock? And then we discussed a very famous problem, the guiding philosopher's problem. So uh, you should know a bit about that problem, especially why can deadlocks occur in the guiding philosopher's problem? You should be able to describe a solution to solve the dining philosopher's problem. And we discussed different solutions. So you should also be able to discuss the efficiency of the solution you provided and maybe of different solutions. Finally, you should be able to explain how deadlocks could actually be prevented. So what requirements need to be fulfilled so you can prevent deadlocks. You should know what a safe and an unsafe state is. And uh, for an alternative, you should also know uh, which methods might be used in an operating system to resolve a deadlock and what their benefits and drawbacks actually are. In lecture eight, then, we talked about how we can actually get from a program we write, so from our source code in C, for example, to a process that we execute. So we talked about details of processes and binaries in Unix, some virtual memory basics, and how processes are started. So here we talked about Unix uh, internals uh, in detail. So you should know what an ELF executable file is, what the most important sections of that executable is, uh, are, and what actually is stored in each of these important sections here. You should know what the tasks of a compiler, assembler, linker, and loader are. You should also know what a linker does related to symbol resolution. Uh, you should know why virtual memory was introduced and why this is useful. Uh, you should be able to explain how the translation from virtual to physical addresses work. And you should also know about a typical virtual memory layout of a Unix process and how this virtual memory layout is related to these sections in an ELF executable file. And then we talked a bit about optimizations, especially about shared libraries. So you should know what a shared library is and why it is useful. And related to this, then you should be able to explain the difference between a linker and the dynamic loader in Unix LDSO. And finally, we talked about Unix process creation. So you should know a bit about Unix process creation. 
uh, especially the effects on physical and virtual memory spaces for the most important syscalls, fork and exec here. And you should know how fork and exec interact. You do not need to know the exact details we discussed on process creation. So you don't need to know by heart that there's an init function which calls ellipsc start function, which does other things, which finally calls main. These are interesting details, but they're not relevant for our exam. In lecture nine, we then discussed another abstraction, an abstraction for memory and how this is managed. So main memory, the RAM in a computer as a resource. So uh, you should know about the requirements that we uh, need to ask uh, for, from the operating system related to memory management on a multi-programming system. So on a system that's able to execute several processes at the same time. You should know about policies and strategies which are relevant for memory management. We discussed a number of these. You should be able to describe the basic problem of memory allocation. And of course, remember, uh, you implemented a heap allocator in the practical exercise. So you should probably also read up on this and the related malloc and free calls. Uh, then you should know how dynamic memory allocation works. You can, should be able to describe different approaches and their benefits and drawbacks. Then we also talked about placement strategies, so you should be able to name and describe uh, different placement strategies. And then we talked about problems, especially memory fragmentation. So related to memory fragmentation, you should explain the different types of memory fragmentation and their properties. And uh, you should also be able to explain where different allocation methods that we discussed are typically used. So some are used for disks, some are used for main memory and so on. And finally, related to memories and processes, you should be able to describe differences between approaches to swap processes, to use segmentation and to use paging. Uh, especially important is how paging uh, actually works as an operating system concept and how this interacts with the memory management unit hardware component of your CPU. And you should also think about how paging is optimized nowadays using hardware approaches or even software approaches. In lecture 10, we then talked about details of virtual memory implementations. So we talked about why things like virtual memory actually work. So this is a generalization or well, rather a special case of caching. So essentially the question of how can you actually run large programs on a computer with very little memory. So uh, in this relation, we talked about the locality principle. So there are different locality principles, temporal and spatial locality. So you should be able to know about these and you can uh, should be able to describe the properties of temporal and spatial locality and why they are relevant for optimization. Uh, you should know the idea behind virtual memory. You should be able to explain which abstraction or illusion we actually create for an application by implementing virtual memory in the operating system. You should be able to explain how demand paging works. You should know what a page fault is and how it is handled in the operating systems. And you should in general know the tasks of the OS and also the hardware, so the, their interaction when a page fault is handled. So when we handle page fault, we have a page fault, we have seen different page replacement strategies. So you should be able to name different page replacement strategies like FIFO's optimal, LIU, second chance. And you should also be able to discuss their benefits and drawbacks. And you should also be able, given for example, a current memory allocation and a number of subsequent memory requests to actually simulate the behavior of one of these page replacement algorithms. Uh, we also dis discussed problems again, uh, an important problem is thrashing. So you should be able to define thrashing and you should give some, be able to give some causes for thrashing and possible solutions, how you can avoid thrashing. And related to this, you should be able to explain what the working set of a process is. And also we had to look at an algorithm that helps you to determine the working set of a process. Now, when we have different processes, we have already seen methods 
actually communicate in a very simple way using blocks or semaphores. But of course, we also want to exchange more complex data. So we have looked at interprocess communication approaches in general to exchange data and not only the information that we want to use a shared resource. So uh, you should be able to explain different approaches to interprocess communication and also, of course, again, explain their benefits and their drawbacks. You should know about the primitives for message-based communication, so which synchronization methods can be used, synchronous, asynchronous communication, what are the properties of these, how can you actually address a process that you want to communicate with, which different message formats exist, and related to this, of course, which IPC methods are actually uh, provided by a typical Unix system. So can you describe the concepts and also the use of so the programmer's uh, application of signals of named and unnamed pipes of Unix message queues and also of sockets. And finally, you should also be able to explain what remote procedure calls are and what the fundamental difference or the relation of remote procedure calls to interprocess communications uh, is. In lecture 12, we then switch to, well, discussing time. So how to enable this illusion that a processor can execute several programs at once, but of course it cannot, considering a uniprocessor, and we only talked about single processor systems in the, uh, the run of this course here. So uh, for this, you should be able to define the terms dispatching and scheduling. You should know different dispatch states for processes and on which level of scheduling they actually uh, are related to. You should also describe some details of short, medium and long term scheduling. And you should also know about the process state transitions that are related to different scheduling levels. Important is obviously that you can explain preemptive scheduling, the advantages that preemptive scheduling has, but also maybe the problems that you have to solve as an operating system uh, developer uh, when you need to implement preemptive scheduling. We have taken a look at uh, different uh, scheduling strategies, so you should be able to give examples for scheduling strategies and explain how they work. Uh, you should also be able to determine scheduling orders for a given strategy. So like for memory allocation, here you should also be able to actually replay a given scenario when you have an initial condition and a number of requests and a given strategy that you need to implement. So you should actually be able to explain the steps an operating system would take when it applies this strategy. For example, which process is the next process, when is a process preempted and so on. And of course, again, uh, discussing the benefits and drawbacks of different scheduling strategies, as always, is important because you want to evaluate different strategies when you write an operating system, finally, in order to know which one you should implement. We also talked about multi-level scheduling and priorities. So priorities is important. So how does multi-level scheduling work? What is the uh, role of priorities in this? And finally, we took a look at uh, details of scheduling strategies. So you should also be able to give details of scheduling strategies in Unix and here also in Windows. So we've skipped lecture 13, which as I mentioned is not relevant for the exam. So in uh, lecture 14, we continue with IO management and disk scheduling. So now we had uh, already discussed CPU scheduling, memory allocation. So now the third big class of hardware resources, IO devices, are the center of this lecture here and how to manage them. So you should be able to explain how a device and the operating system interact. You should be able to name different methods for interaction like polling, like interrupts, like DMA and explain them. We have seen there are different classes of devices. So you should be able to explain which classes of devices exist like character and block devices. You should be able to give their properties. You should uh, be able to explain how interrupts and DMA work. You should also be able to explain how IO devices can actually be addressed by the operating system. And related to this, you should know what a device driver is and how this interacts with the hardware on the one hand side, but also with the applications on the other side. And then you should of course know, uh, in summary, what the various tasks of the operating system 
related to device handling are. And then again, we went into details of device handling in Unix, so you should be able to explain how devices are represented and abstracted in Unix, so you should know about device special files and how to use them. You should be able to name properties of and differences between these classes of devices like character, block, and other devices. And you should also be able to explain how the operating system actually implements this relation of the device special file to a given device driver. So this is about device numbers uh, as a hint here. And then finally, of course, you should know about the system and the C calls to be able to use devices and user processes. Here again, this Unix philosophy, everything as a file comes into play. So the related syscalls and libc functions between devices and files are very similar. There might be additional ones for devices like the IO control call. And in this uh, context, we also discussed buffering. So you should be able to explain why buffering is important and to describe problems with bufferings and advantages due to buffering. Uh, one very important uh, structure, especially for communicating data between hardware and device drivers, or also between device drivers and applications is a ring buffer. So you should be able to explain how a ring buffer works and where, where and how it is typically used. And finally, we talked about I.O. scheduling for disk drives, so different methods to move your head on a physical disk. Uh, so you should know how uh, I.O. scheduling works, which different approaches there are, and you should be able to simulate them. You should be able to explain their pros and cons uh, in this context here. Well, in the previous lecture, we talked about disks, and we also have a method to ab abstract disks, so we don't need to access disks as just raw block devices from a user process point of view. So in lecture 15, we talked about file systems, so files as an abstraction of space on the disk and how we are managing these. So you should know what the abstraction of a file actually is and why it's useful. You should know about the system calls and libc functions in Unix that are used to handle files. And of course, you have used them already in the practical exercises. You should be able to explain what a virtual file system is and how this actually works. And related to this, what is mounting and unmounting of a file system? What's the effect of these operations on the directory tree of a Unix system? You should know uh, methods to uh, map files to disk blocks, so you should be able to describe the problems of different approaches. You should know about methods to manage free space on the disk. And finally, we discussed several real-world file system implementations, like MS-DOS, for example. Uh, you uh, should know about these, but especially you should also know about the directory and inode structures for several typical file systems, especially in Unix, so System 5 Unix, BSD, Fast File System, and the ext2345 systems we discussed in Linux. In lecture 16, then, we uh, discussed uh, more recent developments in file systems, so file systems 2, modern file systems. So here we discussed the challenges for file systems in today's systems, so especially reliability of disks, how we can improve the reliability of disk storage, how we can improve the performance of disk storage, and then we already talked about buffering. So again, you should be able to relate that buffering concept in general to the Unix block buffer cache, and you should be able to explain what it does and how it works. And then we talked about logical volume management. So you should know what this is, why it is useful. And finally, we talked about rates or redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. So you should be able to know uh, yeah, and explain the different levels of rate, how they work, and what the benefits and problems of these are related to things like, yeah, again, reliability and performance especially. And finally, we talked about journaling and log structured file systems. So you should be able to explain the differences between traditional, for example, Unix file systems and journaling and log structured file systems. And you should be able to give an overview of how these actually work. In lecture 17, we then talked about operating system architectures, so especially about virtual machines and microsystems. So how do we build modern operating systems and even infrastructures for running different operating systems at the same time on one and only computer? 
So you should be able to define the different architectures of operating systems. So you should, should be able to define what a monolithic kernel is, what a microkernel is, what a hypervisor is, and what the differences between these are in terms of concepts and also of implementation. Uh, you should uh, be able to explain the problems of first-generation microkernels and how these problems were solved in second-generation microkernels. So what is the most important thing to enable uh, the real uh, working and applicable second-generation microkernels? Related to this, you should be also able to explain what an exokernel is and what the difference between a micro and an exokernel is. And then, based on exokernels, you should be able to explain the concept of virtualization and what this actually does. You should be able to define the terms of a virtual machine monitor or hypervisor and explain in or broad terms how they work. We have looked at different types of hypervisors, type 1 and 2 hypervisors, so you should be able to explain the difference between the architectures of system software using type 1 and type 2 hypervisors. You should uh, yeah, explain the performance problems of virtualization and also the functionality problems of virtualization on, well, ordinary hardware and then also explain what hardware support was actually introduced to enable and improve virtualization. In this context, you should also be able to explain power virtualization and what the benefits and drawbacks of power virtualizations are. And finally, related to hypervisors, there's the concept of a hypercall. So you should also be able to explain what a hypercall is. But of course, you don't need to explain in detail how this works because we didn't discuss the details of this in the course. This is an advanced topic, which would be content of an advanced operating systems lecture, but not of this introductory course here. Lecture 18 then went a step further towards applications, especially of hypervisors. So we talked about modern topics like clouds and unikernels, especially not that much about single address space operating systems. So I took out that topic to reduce the overhead a bit. So uh, we took the step here from virtualization to cloud and operating systems for the cloud. So for cloud systems, you should be able to define different service models, their properties, benefits and drawbacks, different provisioning models. You should be able to give a rough overview of the architecture of a cloud OS and explain differences to a regular operating systems system. You should be able to explain the special strategic decisions that a cloud operating system has to take compared to a regular operating system. You should know what a container is. You should be able to explain uh, in broad terms how this works and how containers are related to virtualization. So what is virtualized using a container and on which level. And uh, you should also be able to explain how virtual memory management interacts with virtualization for the cloud. So you have virtualization as in hypervisors and you have virtualization as in virtual memory. And these interact and depending on how these interact, uh, think of terms like shadow page tables and so on, you should be able to explain in broad terms what the problems might be and maybe also how hardware can actually help. So which optimization approaches exist and uh, the question is, can you describe that? And finally, we don't only need to virtualize memory and CPUs, but also I.O. So the final question in that lecture 18 was how I.O. can be virtualized for the cloud or in general in a hypervisor environment, which uh, approaches exist. And again, of course, benefits and drawbacks. Then we had a lecture on operating system security one. So this was uh, discussing basics of security and security management in the operating system. So here you should be able to define the terms security and also safety and explain the difference. You should be able to explain what the task of operating system security is. You should know what malware is. You should be able to give examples for this. You should be able to contrast the use of malware by attackers compared to social engineering. You should know uh, different types of malware. You should be able to define them. So viruses, worms, and so on. And then you should be able to uh, explain a bit about security concepts and operating systems. So what is permission management? Why do we need this? Which requirements do we have to ask from permission management in an operating system? Especially important is the principle of least privilege. So you should be able to explain this, obviously. And then we took a look at a concept to define privileges. Uh, 
uh, the access matrix. So you should be able to define the contents of an access matrix and you should be able to describe the different ways to use this. So for example, uh, with file and process attributes and units with access control lists, capabilities and mandatory access control and how these relate to your access matrix. You should uh, also be able to explain how the MMU and also the CPU privilege levels contribute to security of a system. And you should also try to explain what software-based protection is, maybe give an example for software-based protection, maybe in a compiler. And you should also be able to explain typical software bugs like buffer overflows that can contribute to security problems. And you should be able to give an example or to explain an example here. And that's it. So this was a very quick walkthrough one semester in the course of 45 minutes. Of course, I only asked questions mostly. I didn't answer them. That's your task. And I hope this list of questions and of topics will help you in preparing for the exam. Obviously, if there are questions, feel free to ask questions if something's unclear. So that's all for this semester. Thanks for participating, even if, uh, well, many of you had to take this course as mandatory. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I hope you learned a bit about this. And of course, I hope you find this topic interesting. So if I actually uh, didn't manage to scare you off that topic, but actually managed to interest you in that topic of operating systems and related stuff, please feel free to get in touch for upcoming projects if you're going for a master and of course master thesis and also if you uh, would be interested to work as a student research assistant on operating system related topics so we have several topics for example related to iot operating systems to operating systems for arm like raspberry pi systems and also for very modern risk five systems that are going on and we have additional projects on these we are also discussing uh, operating systems for distributed controllers for mobile autonomous robots and of course if you only want to chat about operating system topics or you just have general questions of course feel free to get in touch but uh, I need to mention one thing I have no idea how Windows works so if you have a problem with Windows systems it might be better to ask someone else if you have a problem with Unix systems feel free to ask me I should be able to give you some more hints on this. So thanks again for participating in my course. Thanks for uh, working through all the complex practical exercises. Thanks for all of your feedback. Uh, I wish you, well, not good luck because it's not luck in the exam. That was, that's what one of my high school teachers told me. I wish you all the best of success in your exam. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll meet again in another course or in a project. I would be happy to work with you on operating systems topics and also on related topics of hardware interaction, of virtualization, of compilers, of code optimization, and so on. So all the low level system software topics and their relation to hardware. So that's all from my side. I hope you can still enjoy your semester break a bit, even in this difficult Corona time. I hope you can find time to prepare for the exam and all the best for this and for your future studies. Thanks a lot again and maybe until next time. Bye.